Hey everybody and welcome to part 3 of SCP-610. If you've not seen part 1 and 2, please do so before watching this or else you're not really going to understand it. You can find the links below in the description, in the video cards and also the suggested videos. You can also find a playlist of all the parts on the channel. Without further ado, let's get straight into this. SCP-610-L4 Events regarding the discovery, research and handling of SCP-610 rapidly degraded to a point where fail-safe options were being considered. For over one hour, nothing further had happened at Site A following the loss of the research teams during the seismic events in SCP-610-L3 and subsequent contact with previously unseen 610 life forms. With the absence of activity at Site A, a remote drone dispatch was authorised in two parts. The first part would drop a remote relay device at the entrance to Site A sinkhole and the second part would dispatch a drone into the hole directly to relay its data to the remote relay for transmission back to HQ. Drones on site were powered by a solar energy with a battery maintaining a 4 hour charge. Attached is the video log recovered from the Site A sinkhole drone before its loss. Video feed activate. Researchers face is seen looking into camera applying a polishing cloth to the lens. This is Explorative Drone, RSCP-610-1, coming online. Systems check out, video confirmed, feed is good to relay station. We're testing rotors now and deploying if successful. The sound of a helicopter blade starts up as video feed begins to lift in the air. Camera tilts left and right to test pan features, then directs itself towards the Site A sinkhole. Video feed is go, engines are go. Links are green, alright, sending down the drone now. Audio from the outside world fades away as camera angles itself down and peers into the darkness within the sinkhole. After approximately two minutes of descent, lights on the drone activate and illuminate a roughly dug shaft. Initially, it is unclear what could have created the hole, but at a glance, it would appear the shaft was created by a single event rather than dug over time. At 15 meters descent, there are traces of SCP-610 material attached to the dirt and stuck to rocks. The material is dormant but retains its texture and appearance, unlike samples from above ground level which shrivel and dry rapidly. There is a possible connection with this material and the events last recorded during SCP-610-L3. Descent continues. At 100 meters in depth, branch tunnels become visible in the walls and the sinkhole. Panning of the camera reveals small tunnels branching out at apparently random intervals, but which are not restricted to any of the side of the hole. These tunnels are considered too small for any useful exploration to occur. Descent continues. Increase in density of SCP-610 materials on walls is noted as depth increases. At 250 meters, the bottom of the sinkhole becomes visible and the tunnel slopes sharply, suggesting unnatural formation, which was already suspected. Drone video shifts to illuminate the tunnel and drone proceeds further to through the area. SCP-610 coats entirety of the tunnel now and care is taken to keep the drone from coming in contact with any surface. Movement is detected 5 meters ahead. Lights on the drone are dimmed and weapons come online. The RSCP-610 drone is equipped with a 5.56mm machine gun containing 50 rounds of ammo. This is meant to be used to deter wildlife away from the drone and defend against aggression when possible, rather than to dispatch a target, although it is fully capable of handling human aggressors in small groups. Camera focus turns to the moving mass of flesh ahead of it at 3 meters. After focus clears, the movement appears to be coming from what appears to be a deer, uninfected, wriggling in the grips of tendrils composed of SCP-610 material. The deer is being suspended above the ground with unclear intent. The drone is moved past the trapped deer while holding it in view of the camera until safely away. Nothing occurs with the deer and the drone proceeds past undisturbed. The previously fairly level ground of the tunnel displays large humps in apparently random placement 5 meters ahead of the drone. 30 meters past the encountered deer. Upon approach, these lumps turn out to be similar to the infected villagers who escaped from Site A into the sinkhole after the destruction of Site C. The sound of rushing water is now detected and the drone is pushed forward. 100 meters further into the tunnel and the sound of running water is now deafening. Drone lights reveal a running stream of water potentially from one of the adjacent rivers in the area. A sample vial is placed in the water, allowed to collect, and then released with an active tracking beacon. Later recovery of this sample indicates no SCP-610 contamination of groundwater. The tunnel splits in two at this point. One tunnel leads around the river and then seems to slope downward, while the other is directly above a light source in the ceiling. The second one is selected to facilitate recovery of the drone. During adjustment of the drone's flight path, it comes in contact with a portion of the tunnel wall coated in 610, causing a deep gash from the propeller of the drone, 
which is already healing over before the camera focuses on the impact point. The drone proceeds upwards. 300 metres of upwards travel taking approximately 45 minutes results in the drone emerging into a windy section of mountain where it is directed to stay low. Camera panning of the area reveals that it may have once been a village, long since abandoned. The precise location is unclear but it is assumed to be in the vicinity of Site B judging from estimates in travel by the drone. The buildings here are coated in deceased layers of SCP-610 and unlike other buildings in Site A and Site C which were coated in 610, these buildings appear to be constructed directly from the tissue substance. After a cursory scan of Site B, it is determined that there is no life here, either natural or 610 related, so the drone is directed back into the tunnel, as the winds around the area make area recovery impossible. Upon descent into the tunnel, a deep roaring sound fills the audio, and video feed becomes choppy as something blocks the signal. During the periods in which the connection to the drone is clearest, its camera and weapon are angled downwards, and propellers slow in speed to allow a faster drop. Video feed becomes entirely clear for the final two minutes before feed is lost. Rushing up towards the drone from the area below is what appears to be a large human face, stretched to 20 times its proportions with no features, save those created by the 610 material. There are eye sockets but no eyes, a mouth but no teeth. The drone fires upon the rushing mass of 610 but the bullets do not deter it, impact points remaining visible for several seconds before closing over themselves. There is no room in the tunnel for the drone to take evasive action, and it is swallowed by the mass. RSCP-610 is considered lost until three hours later when feed inexplicably returns. Video feed from the drone appears to show a series of structures illuminated by one or two of the drone lights. The camera pans around without instructions from the remote relays or HQ, capturing a vast number of shambling entities within the area. SCP-610 material moves over the lens of the drone and the video feed is permanently severed. Man exploration was approved. Results are in document SCP-610-L5. SCP-610-L5 Approval from Central HQ was granted for a manned assault excursion into the tunnels beneath Site A to try to ascertain the extent of the SCP-610 infection. The destruction of Site A and Site C have established SCP-610 can be contained and destroyed, making the source of the infection top priority. The initial descent into the tunnels consists of five teams, two research and three assault, along with enough equipment to establish an underground base of operations. Descent into the tunnels was established using pulley systems and a lift to move equipment. Assault teams were the first to descend, armed with flame units to clean SCP-610 out of the area. All teams were able to descend without incident and flame units took point providing an undisturbed journey towards the water source where the RSCP-610 drone was lost. Base camp for underground SCP-610 operation resides at the bottom of a freeway junction, four if the water flow is included. The first pathway is that leads from Site A to Cavern HQ. The second is the pathway to the ruined village residing in the mountains above where RSCP-610 was destroyed by a large unknown 610 entity. The third pathway leads west and seems to follow the flow of water for an unknown distance. The cavern area here is quite large and is supported by a number of rock formations that are coated with the decayed 610 material. The state of this material suggests great age and appears to reinforce the structural supports. Whether or not this is in intentional or coincidental is unknown. The two research teams split activities between building Cavern HQ and collecting samples of 610 in various states. No contagious material were detected within the area and the creature recorded by unmanned drones did not appear at any point to the cavern staff. Of the four research teams, three were ordered to proceed down the unexplored pathway while an aerial drone was prepped for second recon of the vertical shaft. SCP-610 infection did not appear in the third pathway until approximately 3 kilometers, and serious infection did not appear until 16 kilometers in. Even after the lengths travelled by the assault team, no 610 infectious life forms were encountered, and the fleshy material coating the cavern walls posed no threat to the team. The most significant reports at this time were the increase in thickness of material, suggesting a source, and the complete lack of 610 contamination in the water. As a test, a sample of 610 was cut away from the cavern wall and placed in the flow of water. It exhibited no unusual reactions but was quickly swept away by the current. At 20 kilometers in, the leader of the assault teams requested a transport buggy to be dispatched to them. One was available at the above ground HQ, however it would take time to move it to the cavern HQ and then remote drive it to the teams. Rations provided to the assault teams were sufficient, 
so a camp was established while the buggy was moved and readied. During this time, an aerial drone was also sent to explore the vertical shaft. The results of this exploration were placed on hold with the arrival of the buggy at Cavern HQ and ultimately concluded in document. The buggy was navigated to the assault team encampment with no events en route. However, upon arrival and preparation to continue the exploration, the assault teams came under attack by a number of large SCP-610 infected lifeforms that emerged from the area ahead of them. Video recovered from assault team cameras shows them caught off guard as the 610 infected made no sound and were undetectable. On one film for one or two seconds it appears that some of the creatures are coming out of the 610 materials on the wall, not emerging from them so much as being created by the material and then breaking away to act independently. During the assault, in an attempt to protect the buggy, members were lost to the water currents and contact with them was lost. Contact was regained, however, and is recorded in SCP-610-L6. The remainder of the assault team now consisted of three members, armed with a single flame unit. Use of this unit to repel the creatures proved vital, as standard firearms did minimal damage to the infected creatures. These infected creatures showed minimal traits to associate them with any known life form in the region giving rise to the belief that they may have been spawned by the 610 infection itself as a form of defence. No further casualties were suffered during the raid, and the remaining members managed to eliminate all attacking infected, allowing them to continue with exploration with added orders to attempt to locate lost team members. A further 20 kilometres into the tunnel, and the river separated from the tunnel pathway and the team was instructed to abandon the recovery order, given the inability to navigate water safely. A total time of passed before the remaining assault team reached an end in the tunnel. At the perimeter of the area now known as Site B, the team came under assault again from a smaller number of SCP-610 that were much larger in size. These infected appeared in the tunnel as if they were lying in wait for the approaching team. These creatures were dispatched using the flame unit, although all fuel for this unit was expended in this act. The assault team was now limited to standard weapons and short-range personal flame units. A time lapse of five minutes is allowed to pass before the team proceeds further into Site B, cautious of further assaults by SCP-610 infected. The tunnel widens out into what appears to have once been a village of indeterminate age. The construction of the buildings in this area are primitive compared to the settlements of Site A and Site C, and are clearly human construction. Many buildings rest at angles or slants, suggesting that they were disturbed by a cave-in. Of interest is a building that appears to be a church with a working clock tower. This building is built atop the remains of two older buildings that have fallen completely, and has visibly stable foundation. Surrounding all structures in this area is a depression in the ground filled with a substance resembling a liquefied form of 610 fleshy materials. The pool moves as if acted upon by minute and unseen forces rippling outward from in invisible contact points and rolling in waves from unfelt winds. The team avoids this pool at all times and proceeds through the ruins slowly on stable foundations where possible, making the church their target area. Within the church are pews, as would be expected, however there are only four, one of them shattered, when the building could accommodate as many as twenty. The three intact pews are arranged in a two-one formation facing a pulpit. There is no trace of dust on any surface, the entire area appearing to be immaculately clean, given the location of believed age. Behind the pulpit is a hole in the floor exposing an area of SCP-610 pool beneath the building. The church and ruins appear to be uninhabited and exploration of the church proper is uneventful until the clock tower bell tolls. The tolling triggers a shudder in the building, followed by a human screams from the ceiling. Lights shone upon the ceiling reveal a large mass of 610 from which descend a series of six wooden circles. Strapped to each circle is a living human coated entirely from neck to toe in 610 but having an exposed head which appears uninfected. These human captives scream as the bell continues to toll and the circles move to the ground. The team begins to move toward one to investigate when an unknown creature cries from outside the building, prompting them to take cover in shadows near the pulpit. Light sources are extinguished, pitching the entire area into darkness. Night vision is left off to avoid revealing the team's location. Sounds continue to emit from the outside of the church, drawing closer but lower than the frantic screams of the captive humans. At least one notices the team as the captive humans often called out to be saved. From the entrance of the church, a candle lights on the side of the doorway and then one on the other side. A figure is seen holding a small torch and moving back and forth between a series of candles to light the doorway. 
The flame is then applied to a rope coated in 610, which quickly ignites and spreads up to the peculiar chandelier system at the church entrance. The light from the system illuminates most of the crosses, but does not reach the team's hiding place. But those captives who appear in the light do not show standard signs of the beige-coloured 610 infection, but instead are wrapped in a red variant of it, which shows signs of constant motion, rippling across itself in waves. From outside the church, a flood of 610 infected shamble quickly into the area, ignoring the man who lit the candles and stands in the middle of the room. They proceed to the captives on the wooden circles and begin to pull at the red 610 masses, resulting in further screams and cries. From what can be gathered from the return video feed, the red SCP-610 seems to be connected to the captives and is using them as a source of sustenance that it then uses to grow and feed the normal 610 infected. Overly zealous infected tear the red mass too hard, which results in pulling skin and tissue from the human captives beneath. This exposed area is quickly covered over by the red mass, which then grows in size. Feeding like this continues for approximately six minutes, at which time the candle bearing figure sounds a gong and all infected entities move to the pews. There are several more creatures then seats, but none move past the frontmost pews. The figure who sounded the gong does not move, spontaneously collapsing as if made from hollow clay. From the pulpit area, activity is noticed as a pillar of SCP-610 flesh rises through the hole and extends, directing itself towards the gathered creatures. No sound is heard and no motion is recorded once the pillar stops moving. This silent period persists for 10 minutes without even human captures making a sound, having fallen silent at an unknown point. The pillar of SCP-610 retracts back into the hole it emerged from without any warning, prompting the departure of the infected from the building. The candles remain lit and the team emerges after all infected appear to have left the area. The descended captives remain at ground level as well, all screaming seeming to have ceased, but still showing signs of life with heavy breathing and movement. Upon departure from the church, camera feed from all three members becomes erratic. Camera 1 ceases transmitting completely. Camera 2 shoots straight up into the air for several meters. And camera 3 captures the member with camera 2 being flung by a tendril that emerges out of the ground itself, swinging them out of sight onto the other side of the ruins. Camera 1's feed is restored and displays camera 3's owner running briefly in the direction of the lost team member, only to turn and run back as SCP-610 infected pour from between the buildings. Combat ensues between the two members and the onrushing infected, using assault rifles and personal flame units, successfully driving back enough of the horde to make an escape towards the buggy. Passing by a building, Camera 1's owner is ambushed by a figure resembling the figure who was in the church lighting candles, wielding a large crop scythe. Camera 3's owner continues without pause towards the buggy location, however the buggy is found half absorbed by the SCP-610 mass covering the floor. While turning to find another way to escape, Camera Fiend's owner turns to find the same figure with a scythe approaching, weapon raised. Two shots are fired and the camera feed ends. Five hours later, while final decisions were underway to decide how to contain or eradicate the SCP-610 threat, time-delayed video feed from the lost team members who fell into the underground river currents was established and has been filed in SCP-610-L6. Part 4 will be coming out soon, be sure to check out my Facebook and Twitter to get updates and if you can't wait that long then consider becoming a Patreon to help make this channel my career. You'll get access to images for the next video as they're completed, Patreon exclusive news about collabs, uh, SCP request priority, your own sketches and so much more. And special thanks to Ethan, Hulk and Stefu, your pledges are very much appreciated, thank you. See you all very soon guys.